So we're going to take a look tonight at the resurrection, the ascension, the session, and the return of Jesus Christ. All of that in one evening. Yes, I guess you could say we are feeling a bit crazy on this. So we're not going to, there's going to be no ado here. We're going to dive straight into this because I am overly concerned. We're going to be going on a long time here tonight, but I trust that God will bless us as we look at what has historically and typically been called the exaltation of Christ. And so we're going to read the Apostles' Creed. We've been doing that each week as we launch into this series. I think think that is a practice that is important in the Christian church to be reminded of these unifying, ancient and venerable Christian statements of doctrine, these, these creeds. And so we're going to do that again tonight by way of introduction. Then we're going to dive into these three clauses, that Christ is resurrected, He has ascended, and He returns to judge the quick and the dead. So let me read the Apostles' Creed by way of introduction. Then we're going to dive into our discussions here this evening. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, Our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day, he arose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. God's people uttered their approval in saying, Amen. This is the Christian creed. To believe this, to lay hold of these doctrines as a conviction of the heart, is definitionally what it means to be a Christian to deny the truths contained in this creed, to, to, to depart from them, is to prove oneself to be apostate. And that has been true for close to 2,000 years of Christianity. We might differ on secondary doctrines. We might have different points of view or perspectives on certain tertiary uh, doctrines of the Christian faith. But these are the essential truths which unite believers everywhere in Christ. So as I said a moment ago, theologians have been comfortable for for a very long time, centuries and centuries in fact, in, in dividing the life of Christ into one part, his humiliation, and the next part, his exaltation. So in his humiliation, we should understand that Christ took definitive steps downward in condescension. So we're going to lean a little bit on Philippians 2 here, and these phrases should, should remind you of that. The equality with God was not a thing that Christ reached out to grasp. He was made of no reputation, the form of a servant, the likeness of men, became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You you should see that as step by step by step down and lower and lower and lower into his humiliation where the creed takes us to confess this, even death on a cross to become a curse for us, he descended into hell. And then what Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 says, I'll read this from the text. It says, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. The steps upward. So so Jesus starting out as, as truly God down into the depths of his lowest condescension. Now tonight we're going to spend time looking at the ascent, if you like, if you will, of Christ. His resurrection out of the grave. His ascension back to heaven. His reign and rule. What what theologians call his session. He sits on a throne right now. He he truly does reign right now over all the earth and and all the universe. And of course his, his return. His return for which he will judge the world in righteousness. Let's take a look at the fifth clause of the Apostles' Creed, which invites us to meditate upon the resurrection of our Savior. Last Sunday night, as we're working through this series, clause by clause, we discovered that Jesus Christ was crucified under Pontius Pilate, that he was dead 
and buried and descended into hell. We spent a whole lot of time talking last week. You have to go revisit that message that Jesus didn't actually go to hell after he died, but that his death on the cross was hell. It was the totality of the wrath of God poured out upon him where Isaiah 53 can say that his soul was made an offering for sin. Him being dead, him being buried. Now the clause invites us, as I said, to meditate on his resurrection. Clause 5 says, the third day he rose again from the dead. Christians have, have always known that the doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central foundational truth for which all of our hope and all of our expectation is tied to. In the words of the great theologian John Calvin, he said it like this, as the resurrection of Christ is the most important article of our faith, and without it, the hope of eternal life is extinguished. In the words of the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul will state it even more tersely. He will say that if Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain. You're still in your sins. And of all people everywhere, we are the most to be pitied. The resurrection of Christ is the cause for our hope, our rejoicing, and faithful expectation of life eternal. Let me offer you three reasons or three uh, specific reasons why the resurrection of Christ is essential to not only our Christian hope, but to the veracity of our gospel, our gospel message. Firstly, Christ must be raised from the dead so that by being raised, he might show all God's people that he truly overcame death. Now that seems, almost, that seems almost too plain and too clear to need articulating. But in the first instance, the resurrection of Christ proves that he has the power over death. And even in his own resurrection, he conquered what the scripture calls our last enemy, which is death itself. Secondly, Christ must be raised because the man who died, Jesus Christ, was the very Son of God, and, and Scripture calls him the very author of life. Because he's the author of life, death could not maintain its grip or its hold of Christ. He is the author of life itself. He must conquer the grave. He must rise from death to life. If he does not rise, then of course he's not truly the Son of God. He's not the author of life. Our faith, as I've already said, is futile. The third reason why Christ must be raised from the dead is because Christ's priesthood, we, we've looked at this in, in weeks previous, the, the, the three offices of Christ as prophet and king and priest, because of the priesthood of Christ has two components, two parts to it. Firstly, he offers up a sacrifice which priests were commanded to do under the old economy of the, of the Old Testament. But secondly, to apply the virtue of his sacrifice to every believer. Christ must take his offering to heaven, present it to, Christ, present it to the Father, and then apply the benefit to every believer. Our Savior must be raised to continue in the office of which the book of Hebrews says, he is in the priesthood of Melchizedek forever. Christ is raised. He cannot remain dead. Sin has no hold on him. He was perfect and pure and holy. And his rising from the grave ensures our hope and our salvation. And I think most importantly, when we meditate upon the resurrection of Christ, the one factor in all of this consideration, and we truly could spend hours upon hours upon hours studying this doctrine, but the key point to remember is that because Christ has been raised, it proves infallibly that the Father has accepted His offering. That as the Son brings to His Father His own death, he, he is the priest who sacrifices and lays down His own life. And when the Father rises by the Spirit of resurrection, when He raises Christ from the dead, it is the proof that the Father has received that offering, accepted it on behalf of sinners like you and I. And most simply, most simply, 
Christ must be raised or Christ is not reliable. Everything he said is to be turned out as, as false and, and, and to be turned out as, as a deceiver. But yet he is raised and our hope is secure. I'm not going to spend a lot more time on Clause 5 because where the bulk of our attention tonight shall be lo located will be in the sixth clause. This is where I feel like Christians, for the most part, have a deficit in their thinking, their theology, around what is known as the, the session of Christ, the, the reign of Christ. What, he, what is He doing right now? I wonder if, if a group of Christians... Evangelicals who, who go to good churches, Bible-believing churches, expositional preaching churches, if they were sat down and polled on this question, what is Jesus actively doing right now? I wonder if you'd get much of a cogent response at all. We're going to speak to the ascension and the reigning of Christ here this evening. I'm going to take a reading from Acts chapter 1, verse 3 to 9. And coincidentally... We know there are no true coincidences, but all, all reality follows after the providential decree of God. But in fact, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. Today, on the Christian calendar is in fact Ascension Sunday. Ascension would have been, according to this year's lunar calendar, which you know Easter follows the, the cycle of the moon, May 21st, 2020, is Ascension Day, making the, the Sunday immediately following, literally, Ascension Sunday. That's not why we're teaching on this. We teach our, our, our preaching calendar is set out way in advance, but according to God's providence, it happens to be this particular Sunday. Acts chapter 1, if you can turn there with me, that'll be helpful. Verse 3 to verse 9. This Christ is raised, and for 40 days... This Jesus, in his resurrected body, spends time with his apostles and disciples, teaching and training and educating them predominantly as to how to understand the Old Testament as entirely pointing and prefiguring Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 3, he presented himself, this is speaking of Jesus, alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. In Jesus going to be with the Father in glory, he demonstrates that he intends on ascending and blessing his church. A key text for our understanding of the necessity of the ascension of Christ and the subsequent session, the very reign and rule of Jesus right now, will of course be Ephesians chapter 4. As Jesus goes to glory, the promise of the Spirit is poured out upon the church. And in all of that going on, there's some significant, even cataclysmic things happening. We pick it up in uh, Ephesians 4 verse 7. This is what it says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He led captivity captive, or some of your translations will say he led a host of captives. That's perfectly viable translation. So now we're starting to think this through, the the captors or, or the captives that, that, that Jesus takes in his reign and in his triumph are, of course, the enemies of him and the enemies of us. Jesus' death on the cross and subsequent resurrection were the sentence passed 
of death onto his enemy. It's essential we think that through. I know we're so prone when we talk about Jesus' death uh, and his burial and his resurrection to apply that predominantly to how that affects our experience. Uh, Our sins are saved. Uh, Our sins are, sorry, our sins are washed away. Our souls are saved. Our forgiveness is granted in the death of Jesus and in his resurrection. But also remembering that according to Scripture, the death of Jesus on the cross, the resurrection of Christ was the sentence of death passed upon his enemies. Sin, Satan, and even death itself. Christ's ascension was the defeat and the binding of these enemies in a very real manner. I don't think Christians often take time to properly appreciate this, and I think tonight we should really focus in our attention upon what this actually means. The ascension of Christ demonstrates the reign and rule of Christ. As he ascended into heaven, he led captivity captive. That which once was the captor of our souls, remember we were enslaved to sin? You remember that we were enslaved to our flesh and and the sinful nature? Remember that that death was the the great king of terrors over us, these, these enemies that held us as enslaved? Jesus has now led those captors captive in ascension. I want to read you a couple of paragraphs here from a theologian named Douglas Kelly, a a contemporary of our times. He wrote for the for the Ligonier Ministry blog. And if you're not familiar with Ligonier, can I just recommend it to you? Only just a couple of weeks ago, this ministry, which many of you may not know the name of the ministry, but you might know the name of the founder of the ministry and the one who predominantly uh, teaches through this, this ministry is Dr. R.C. Sproul. He founded a ministry called Ligonier. It's spelled L-I-G-O-N. I-E-R, L-I-G-O-N-I-E-R. And just recently, they released all of their content entirely free on their app. But let me read you from Douglas Kelly. He wrote this. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 to 3, says that a mighty angel from God binds the devil for a thousand years. Yep, we're going to talk about the millennium. Very rarely do I ever do this, but we're going to do it tonight because we need to do it tonight because we need to have a proper understanding of the ascension of Christ. So Douglas Kelly goes on, specifically verse 3 relates that Satan or the devil or the accuser is bound from deceiving the nations during this period. Something happens to Satan's ability to keep the nations of earth blinded from seeing who God is and what his gospel means for them. As a result of Christ's finished work in dying on the cross, rising from the dead, ascending to the Father, being crowned of the throne of glory, Satan lost the power he previously had to deceive untold millions of pagans and keep them blinded from God's truth. This is what Ephesians 4 is telling us. As he ascended... He took captive Satan himself. There's been a binding of Satan. Douglas Kelly goes on to perhaps offer some some clarity to this. He says, The ancient story of Job may give us some important insight into this massive reduction of Satan's global power over heathen nations. In Job chapter 1, verse 6 to 12, portraying Satan as possessing the ability to come into God's immediate presence along with the other angels called in verse 6, the sons of God. Satan used this place of power to cause great harm to Job, but according to what Christ says in the Gospels, Satan has lost that privileged access to heavenly courts as a result of the incarnation and the work of Christ. So, so Luke, I know I'm going at a rapid pace. I said we had a lot of content to get through here tonight, but I would love if for nothing else tonight, you, you focus your attention in on this whole idea. Let me just, as a side note, When I first prepared this manuscript to preach to you, it was 10,000 words. I've culled it back to three and a half. An average, yeah, round of applause, right? Well done. Uh, I was kidding. I normally preach at about a 2,000 word manuscript, so I'm trying very hard to clarify this as quick as I can. So in Luke 10, this is important. So in Luke 10, 
I'm still reading Douglas Kelly. He wrote this. The 70 disciples returned with great joy from the successful preaching mission. You remember, you can go read it in Luke 10, verse 18 and 19. They healed the sick, cast out demons. And Christ then explains they were able to accomplish these wonders. He said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. This is verse 18. Jesus explains Satan's fall in terms of of the spread of Christian ministry. So there is, there is this coupling here. You, you can see it in, in Ephesians chapter 4. When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. And what? Gave gifts to men. So in the ascension of Christ, there is, there is something final about the binding of Satan and the pouring out upon the church gifts. And what we see in Luke 10 is like a sampling of this. So Jesus says, Jesus says this to his disciples. Remember, they come back and they're, they're giddy with joy. Even demons were subject to us in your name. You remember this? And, and Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. I love the line, John Calvin, if you ever read his commentary on Luke 10, he's got this incredibly terse line. He says, the preaching, or rather he phrases it, he says, the, the thunder of the preaching of the gospel causes Satan to fall like lightning. That's what it is. So when the gospel is proclaimed, Satan falls and plummets. So, so Jesus is, as it were, saying, when you all went out and preached the good news of the kingdom, healed the sick, cast out demons, when you performed mighty wonders in the name of Christ, and you liberated people from the captor of sin and Satan and death, Jesus said, from my standpoint, from my point of view, Satan was collapsing down. Now in the ascension of Christ, Paul wants us in Ephesians to think this through. Verse 19 of Luke 10 says, Behold, this is Jesus. I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Conquered captives, conquered, I should say, conquered captors are now captives. There's been a binding. He went into heaven to open the treasure chest of heaven's goodness and pour them out on his church. Gave gifts to men. Gifts like authority over serpents and scorpions. And he goes on, Paul goes on in Ephesians 4 and clarifies what these gifts to the church look like. There has been a real binding of Satan's power and there has been a pouring out of the Spirit's power. So Ephesians 4, 11 to 14, this speaks of Christ. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of a statue, a stature of the fullness of Christ. Our conqueror, now sits on heaven's highest throne and his conquest is ensuing. Just like, just like Moses. You remember in Exodus chapter 17, there was the instance where, where the, the people of, of the Amalekites came to war against Israel. And Moses went up upon the hill and, and he sent Joshua out with some, some choice men to fight against the Amalekites. And, and Moses says, while you're out on the field on the plain battling, I will be up on the hill. I will be interceding. I will be praying. And, and you know the story that as long as Moses' arms were lifted, the Israelites were continually successful in battle. But if Moses rested his arms or lowered them, the Amalekites would gain the ascendancy. There's a picture in that. There's a metaphor in that for Jesus Christ himself. He has gone up into heaven like Moses ascended the hill, and Christ in glory is interacting and interceding with the Father on behalf of his church. And while he is raising his hands, so to speak, I don't think Jesus literally has got his hands up, but that was the instance of Moses, the church marches forward in triumph. All the while, we are told that Jesus' enemies are being made into his footstool. This would be Hebrews 10, 12 to 13. But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting his enemies to be made his footstool. 
Hebrews chapter 113, same theme. But to which of the angels has God ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Jesus is seated in glory on heaven's throne, reigning and ruling. And in real human history, there is a succession of triumph and victory in the gospel as in real time, Jesus' enemies are being made his footstool. Shouldn't, shouldn't that be observed, don't you think? If all this happens in the ascension, so according to Ephesians 4, he ascends on high, he leads captivity captive. He, he disarms Satan, sin, and death. He pours out gifts upon his church. He blesses his church with authority and power to proclaim the gospel and plunder hell of souls. Shouldn't that be observable? Jesus ascended 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Don't you think there should be some kind of clear and marked difference in the world from 2,000 years ago when he first ascended to now? Well, there should be, and of course, there is. The church is a stupendous gift from God to the world. Even insofar as the world observes it, the church is still the primary. The church is still, in whatever society she is in, is still the primary force for charity and service and blessing. And, and more specific than that, more, more broader than that, a thousand ways civilization has evolved, improved, and been bettered on the foundation of Christian principles. If you're not sure about that, medicine itself. Medicine itself. I mean, you, you don't know the world has evolved until you go back and look at 18th century dentistry. And then you start thanking God with a real deep heart of sincerity that we are in modern times. These things come on the back of Christian advancement. Technology, even the modern scientific method itself, is traceable to the gospel influence. Now, of course, we need to say it, that Christians have been responsible for their fair share of superstition. But a fair reading of history will demonstrate that as, Christian, as Christianity grows in number and in force, it is always to the betterment of the world around it. If for no other reason than two central tenets of Christian conviction. The first one, what we call the imago Dei which is the image of God. This is the belief that we're all created in God's image and each and every individual person has intrinsic value that is inalienable. That doesn't come from other religions or worldviews or, or atheistic materialism or, or humanism. That is the sole benefit of the Christian faith. And secondly, the Christian conviction of the uniformity of nature. The basis for the very modern scientific method itself is founded upon Christian philosophy. In the words of one philosopher recently passed, Greg Barnson, many of you know the work of Greg Barnson, a brilliant apologist. He spoke to the uniformity of nature and, and its cogency, that we can rely on nature itself to be consistent with Itself, because ruling and reigning over this world is a sovereign God. In Bonson's own words, he says this. He says, The method of generalizing from observed cases to all cases of some kind is called induction. The basic guiding principle here is that future cases will be like past cases, that similar things will behave similarly. This is a fundamental Christian doctrine. I wonder if you've ever thought this through, that only on the basis of principles that can only come from a Christian worldview has the entire modern world developed from and been based upon. These two convictions produce a world of incalculable benefits, a world of social freedoms, a world of technological and medical advance. I'm not up here arguing that every great inventor has been a Christian. But I am arguing that every great inventor, whether he knows it or she knows it or not, has borrowed shamelessly from the Christian worldview to do anything of benefit to the world. There's simply no doubt about that. 
Society's improving. We think we live in such a debased age. Do you meet, do you meet that in Christians? Do you ever have that conversation? Oh, the world is so bad. And you think, well, have you ever read a book from history? It's so bad. Oh, we're so immoral. Our society is, is so immoral. The trajectory is, is so awful. You think to yourself, I mean, honestly, have you read about what life was like under Greek rule, Roman rule, under, under Babylonian rule, under Byzantine rule? Where unless you were in some kind of upper crust of society, your life was of no value at all. We need to think more optimistically about the reign of Christ. The reign of Christ in the world today has had incalculable benefits for the world today. What's he doing? He's on the throne. What's his activity on the throne? He is subduing enemy after enemy so that all the kingdoms of the world will soon be called the kingdoms of Jesus Christ. And most importantly, above all those tertiary things like modern medicine, the advent of technology, most importantly, the gospel is surging ahead at rapid speeds. Hell is being plundered. I was doing some research just on the numbers alone. I wonder if you've ever done this. Just look at the growth of the Christian church in the first century, second, third, fourth century. So by the time you get to the fourth century, and it's literally the endorsed religion of the entire Roman Empire. From a group of 120 people in an upper room. Let me give you the numbers in case you've never done this research. In AD 50... A.D. 50, about a century after Christ ascended, the Christian population was already 40,000 people in one century alone. Now, in A.D. 200, it rose, A.D. 200, so 50 years, it rose to 220,000 people. That's staggering revival. In that 50-year period, you went from 40,000, which was already impressive, to 220,000. And by AD 250, get a sense of this. This is before Constantine. Don't think for yourself that you can excuse these numbers away by saying, well, the emperor got converted to Christianity. and He kind of made it cool, so everyone now wanted to be on the bandwagon for Jesus. This is a century before Constantine was even around. The Christian population in another 50 years went from 220,000 to 1.17 million people. The growth only accelerated from there. In the first century of the Christian faith, you had one in 6,000 Christians in the world. One in 6,000. Because although, although those numbers are impressive, contrasted with the population of the world at about 275 million at a conservative guess, you had a chance of being one in 6,000 people to be a believer in the first century of the Christian church. According to Pew Research, the number of Christians around the world has quadrupled even in the last hundred years. I mean, we could spend all night going from century to century, all through the 2,000 years of Christian history. But now let's look at the last hundred years. From about 600 million in 1910 to more than 2 billion in 2010, 2.3 billion in 2015, surging close to 3 billion today. Professed believers. Now, let's say those numbers are inflated because many of those are adherents, perhaps pseudo forms of Christianity. Let's, let's allow that and be conservative. I said that in the first century of the Christian faith, the odds of you being a believer were one person in 6,000. And even if we get conservative with the numbers today, it still rounds out somewhere in about one in every six. When you think about that, that's fairly staggering. We, we all want to have myopic views of the reign of Christ. I mean, we have, this, we have this tendency to kind of be overly negative and pessimistic. But when you just look at the numbers as they are, it's staggering. I haven't even begun to talk about the surge of revival in the Arabic world, in China, in Africa, where revivals are in the thousands of converts a day. Not even being numbered because no one's there doing the kind of census work that would help us to get a grip on how this gospel is surging ahead. 
Okay, we should say that in the Western world, yeah, it looks like we've kind of had our day of revival, doesn't it? It kind of looks like churches are in decline, and numerically that's true. It kind of looks like Christianity has had its day in the Western world, but I'm not that pessimistic to believe that God is through with the Western world just yet. It boils down to this. I encounter this far too often. I I rarely am this direct and clear in my preaching of trying to demonstrate an optimistic view of the reign of Christ. I'm tired of hearing about how the world's just going to go to hell. That's what's going to happen. The dark's going to get darker and well, our hope is just to be vacuumed up out of the world at some point. Abandon it, please. It's not Christianity. Insofar as I think the gospel shows us, there will be triumph in real human history. Too many Christians have a negative view of Christ's session and reign now. The king ascended his throne. Somewhere around about AD 35, the king ascended into his throne. Don't you think we'd see an improvement on his watch? What did you expect? Jesus says to his disciples, it's better for you that I go, because when I go, then I'll pour out the Spirit. Satan will be bound. The church will be triumphant. The gospel will go at speed. Souls will be saved. But you should all be really pessimistic. Doesn't that seem bizarre to you? I mean, why aren't we more excited about the fact that the gospel is creating thousands of new births in the world every day today, and all we want to do is close our eyes, throw up our hands and say, hopefully at some point the rapture comes and rescues us. Can't you see that little measure of leaven is leavening the whole lump? Can't you see that little mustard seed? 120 people in an upper room, terrified. Windows shut, doors barred and locked. He said the Spirit would come. He said, wait in Jerusalem. We'd rather be in any other city of the world than Jerusalem. Just a few weeks ago, they literally murdered our Messiah. We don't want to hang out in Jerusalem. But he said, stay in Jerusalem. He's going to ascend. He's going to lead a host of captives. Satan, sin, and death are going to be chained under his watch. The gospel will surge forth. And on that first day, the day of Pentecost, was the start of the greatest movement the world has or will ever know. And that movement is not done yet. Its finest day is yet to come. Too many Christians have a negative view of Christ's session. Now the king has come on his throne. The change is real. It's observable. It's all around us if you have an eye to see it. Too many Christians have a negative view of Christ's session. He's not sitting there twiddling his thumbs, doing nothing. He's not sitting up in heaven, allowing this whole world, a world that he loves, a world that he calls good, and a sea of humanity which bear his image. Jesus isn't up on the throne, twiddling his thumbs, saying, well, in any moment now, it's all going to go to hell, and then I might do something about it. It's kind of staggering when we actually think through the ramifications of some of the eschatological convictions that we've imbibed, the traditions that we've inherited, and not really been very critical about. If Jesus has ascended, and he sits on a real throne with real power, and throughout this entire 2,000 years of Christian history, the Father has been turning the enemies of Christ into his footstools. And we could rack them up if we wanted to. Emperors who eventually bow the knee. Empires who eventually bow the knee. Worldviews who eventually bow the knee. Soon it will be that all the kingdoms will be the kingdoms of Christ and the believer would have it no other way. He's reigning now. He's ruling now. He's bringing measurable change into the world now. And we get to be witnesses to it. We get to have the height of all optimism. It was this theological view which spurned on what we call the modern missionary movement. You've heard me say this so many times. It's one of those earliest missionaries locked up in the prisons of Burma, Adoniram Judson, who has this optimistic view of Jesus' reign in the world today. And he's locked up in prison. His church has been scattered to the winds. His manuscript of the New Testament has been entirely forgotten and lost. And one of his friends turns and says, what are the hopes of the mission now, Judson? And he says, the hopes are as bright as the promises of God. There's no backing down. There's no relenting. 
We believe that Christ is reigning now, and His reign and His rule is granting this world the grace that it needs to receive its Savior. The third benefit that comes by Christ's ascension is that He ascended to prepare a place for all that would believe in Him. The first benefit we said was that He takes captive the enemies which stand against us. Now when we preach the gospel, Satan falls like lightning. The second benefit, we said that Christ pours out gifts upon His church for the mission, for the purpose of great commission. And thirdly, He goes to heaven to prepare a place for us. John 14, 2, Jesus said this, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Our Savior has gone to glory to prepare a place for us. And the best part of all this According to the seventh clause and the last of our reflection here tonight, let's see if I can do this in a few minutes. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Christ, risen from the grave, ascended into heaven, reigning in session and glory, bringing about real material change into this world, is soon to come again. We look at Acts chapter 1, verse 9, 10, and 11. We read this earlier about the ascent of Christ to heaven. It says, When he, Jesus, had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We consult the Heidelberg Catechism on this. Question 52, what comfort is it to you that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead? The answer offered by the Heidelberg Catechism is, answer 52, in all my sorrow and persecution, I lift up my head and eagerly await as a judge from heaven the very same person who before has submitted himself to the judgment of God for my sake. He has removed all the curse from me. He will cast all his and my enemies into everlasting condemnation. He will take me and all his chosen ones to himself into heavenly joy and glory. Christ, who now reigns in glory, is returning in judgment. And we are told in Scripture that the Spirit and the Bride say, come. That will be a day of finality. That will be a day of vindication. That will be a day of glory. But that day is not this day, because this day is a day of patience. One final text for our consideration, and we've been all over the Bible here, here tonight. Let's take a look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 10, a passage where Peter speaks to this, this question of the, of the return of Christ. And Peter says this in his second epistle, chapter 3, verse 3, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately, Peter says, he assesses these scoffers, he says, they overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, Peter says. Beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth 
and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Scoffers come. And scoffers come, and the license, as far as they're concerned, for their scoffing is the seeming delay of the return of Christ. They say, well, things have continued as they've always been. People have come, people have lived, people have died, and so the cycle continues inevitably. They use this as a license for their sin, but the day of the Lord shall come like a thief in the night. Which means, of course, it'll come at an hour and a time that no one knows. But we are called in Scripture to be prepared. We are called in Scripture to ready ourselves for the return at any moment. In fact, in the first century, it was the predominant view that Jesus' return was imminent. We can see this from various texts of Scripture. Let me give you some. First Peter 4, 7, Peter said this, But the end of all things is near. Be serious in your behavior. Keep watch with prayer. Paul says in Romans 13, 11, Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. James chapter 5, verse 8, You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. The collective consciousness of believers in the first century was that Jesus' return was imminent. So much so that even in the Thessalonian church, the heresy had become rampant that they'd somehow missed it. The return of Christ had actually come and gone, and they were left there without any due course or any kind of help. They just completely missed the arrival of Christ. Paul deals with that heresy in his second epistle to the Thessalonians, but the fact that they were prone to it helps to make my case that Christians in the entire first century had this conviction that Christ will return at an hour that they cannot predict or know, but that they must be ready. Jesus taught this same example in the kingdom, parable of ten virgins. Five came with extra oil and five didn't. And here comes the one that they've been waiting for. And an hour they don't anticipate, the bridegroom comes. And the foolish virgins are left outside and the wise virgins are welcomed in as the bridegroom welcomes them. Readiness and watchfulness are so essential in this hour as we await the Lord's return. But what does Peter say? He says, don't consider the slowness of the apparent return of Christ as God's delay. But he says, consider it as patience. Patience. Why? For God is not willing that people should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Which, which is exactly what we just spoke about in the clause earlier regarding the reign and the rule and the session of Christ. If it was the case that the longer history rolls on, more people are damned, more people are lost, more Christians fall away, more people become apostate, then it would be merciful for God to end it all and intervene now. But Peter almost demonstrates this implicitly by saying the longer the Lord leaves the return of Christ, the more people hear the gospel, the more people are saved from death to life, sins forgiven, and their soul is ransomed in the blood of Christ. It's not delay, it's patience. Louis Burkhoff in his systematic theology says this about the return of Christ. The Christ will return at the end of the world for the purpose of introducing the future age, the eternal state of things. He will do this, Berkhoff says, by inaugurating and completing two mighty events, namely the resurrection of the dead and the final judgment, which we leave for future discussion in our series around the Apostles' Creed. You did very well. We're going to pray. I'm going to close our discussion with a word of prayer. I'm standing up here sweating, but working hard for the sake of expediency that we might meditate upon the exaltation of Christ. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? We seek to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for these great, glorious, intimidating doctrines. Christ is raised, so our faith is not futile. 
Christ is raised, Father. The word of the promise of the gospel is our sins are forgiven if we believe upon him and receive him by faith. Christ is ascended. Bodily he went to personally sit on his throne so that, Father, you can make all his enemies successively his footstool and that his reign might incorporate all the kingdoms of the earth. The gospel might spread an innumerable number of souls saved. And so, Father, we can see that for 2,000 years you've been working your gospel work through your church. But, Father, we want to feel, we want to feel this acutely here this evening. That if in the first century they lived ready and anticipating, how much more ought we to do that now in our generation? Not to become like the scoffers who say, well, it hasn't happened yet. It probably will never happen at all. But to know that the return of Christ could come at a time and a day and an hour which no one anticipates. But let us be found faithful stewards laboring in the vineyard of our Lord. God bless this word to us. What a challenge it's been to hit all the high marks of these doctrines. But I pray that, that this word would be a benefit to our souls and a challenge to our thinking that we may grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And God's people said, Amen. And amen.